Spectroscopy is the study of how light interacts with solutions and objects so you can see different colors. The solutions here are all copper sulfate, but by varying different properties, they all look different. This is because light is interacting with these solutions in a different way, causing them to appear different. Light that interacts with a sample is measured using a spectrophotometer. It's this instrument that gives a certain uh, amount of light that passes through the solution and the amount that gets through is measured on the other side. The solution itself is placed in a special test tube called a cuvette. This is then placed in the spectrophotometer and the resulting percent transmittance or the amount of light that passes through to the other side is measured. By looking at what affects the different levels of transmission, you can get a good sense of what the different properties are for that specific compound. Light interacts with everything from different solid objects to chemical solutions. And it's this interaction of light with different chemicals that is the study of spectroscopy. Spectroscopy is when light interacts directly with chemicals, either in chemical solutions or uh, objects. Light itself typically is white light, so light coming from the sun. And this consists of all different wavelengths. And in spectroscopy, typically a single wavelength or a single energy of light is selected and it's seen how the chemical will interact with that particular type of energy uh, light source. So light in uh, spectroscopy and in spectrophotometers refers to or looks at light that's transmitted and light that's absorbed. Transmitted light is just kind of like it sounds. There's a light source and the chemical solution. The light passes through the solution and some of it, not all of it, is transmitted through to the other side. The reverse of that is the light that is absorbed by the solution. The light energy comes in, it's blocked by the solution, absorbed by those chemicals, and then that increases the energy of those chemicals and can cause various different things, either change in energy levels of the electrons, it can change how fast or how often uh, chemical bonds vibrate uh, between atoms, or even just how the molecule itself rotates around uh, in the solution, and how the light interacts with the chemical will depend on what wavelength and what energy of light that's being used. Absorbance and transmittance are not uh, linearly related. While transmittance is the amount of light that passes through to the other side, absorbance is the amount of light that's blocked, it's not a direct linear relationship. Um, they are logarithmically related to each other. So as the transmittance uh, decreases and the absorbance increases, it's absorbed it's increasing by a greater amount at this low percent uh, transmittance. And they're related through this equation. You can easily convert between one and the other uh, using this equation here, where absorbance is equal to two minus the log of the percent transmission. And this percent transmission is the whole number. So if the percent transmittance was 
the absorbance would be 2 minus the log of 60. You don't have to convert it to uh, a decimal. It's easier to measure the percent transmittance because usually a detector in uh, an instrument is detecting how much light is coming in. Um, and that is linearly re related. And then it can be converted through the log to absorbance. So logarithms are used in a number of different uh, spots in chemistry. You won't use them a lot in this course, but there are a few places where they come up. One is in uh, spectroscopy, converting uh, absorbance between absorbance and concentration. But the other thing, or the other place that you'll see these is when you're looking at acids and bases, where the pH scale is a log scale of concentration of acid. So looking at the log scale, you have negative four, negative three, two, one, zero, one, two, three, four, five. This is how it matches up with a linear scale. These are, you're looking at uh, how many digits are there in the final number. Um, in the case of zero, it's one. And in the case of a log of one, that's up, that's 10, then 100, 1,000, and so on. So when we're looking at spectroscopy and how things relate, uh, how light interacts with different chemicals, we'll look at the absorbance. How much light did the chemical block and absorb into itself and increase its, uh, its energy by that amount? There are three primary things that will affect the absorbance of a solution. First off is the concentration. You can see this in things like uh, soft drinks or beverages where if you have it in a very uh, high concentrated form, it's very, very dark. But if you add a bunch of water to it, the concentration has gone down and now it appears a lighter color. It will absorb less. Similar is the path length. Um, if you have a solution in a large, wide container, looking through the side, it will look very dark. But if you pour that same exact solution into a small test tube, you can look right through it and it will appear lighter. It will absorb less. The reason for both of these is that in either case, the light trying to get through from one side of the container with the solution to the other will need to pass through more molecules, either in the form of a higher concentration of molecules in the same distance, or it has a greater distance to travel, thereby increasing the chance that's going to hit one of these molecules. The last uh, thing that will affect the absorbance is the molar absorptivity constant. And this is just a constant that's related to different chemicals. Each chemical will have its own pattern of how it absorbs light and how it interacts with light. And that changes also with the type of light. So a individual chemical will have a different molar absorptivity constant at every single wavelength of light. And these uh, patterns are very unique for different chemicals and are used a lot in identifying which chemicals you have based on the patterns of absorbance. The three properties that affect absorbance can easily be seen. Concentration and absorbance are directly related. As concentration increases, so does the absorbance. The solution on the left is highly concentrated, while the solution on the right has a concentration of zero. Absorbance and path length 
is also directly related. These two solutions are the same concentration and appear the same shade of blue, the same intensity. However, when looking at a different angle, the solution on the right appears much more deeply colored as the absorbance has increased due to the molar absorptivity constant also changes the absorbance. While, the sa while at the same concentration, the reaction with aqueous ammonia solution creates a much more vivid and dark color, making sure the absorbance has increased. While these two solutions are the same concentration and the same path length, the absorbance is different based on the difference in chemicals. As it was seen, uh, both the molar absorptivity constants, that's uh, the wavelength or just the chemical itself, the path length and the concentration will change the absorbance of a solution or how dark it seems. The relationship between these three is called Beer's Law, where all of them are linearly related to the absorbance. If the path length doubles, the absorbance will also double. If the concentration gets cut in half, the absorbance would also get cut in half. They are linearly related to each other. However, this is only through an, to up to an absorbance of one. Remember, absorbance and transmittance are linearly related. That means that after an absorbance of one, it starts to taper off in a unique way, in a logarithmic way, and is no longer linear. So when you're looking through and using uh, and relating absorbance and concentration, you need to make sure that any absorbance value is below a value of one. So there are two different types of absorbance graphs that are used in spectroscopy. And one of the big ones for identifying things is the absorbance spectrum. And this is a graph of absorbance versus the wavelength of light used. Everything else in this case is being held the same. So it's at a constant concentration a constant path length, and a constant uh, chemical. The only thing that's changing is the type of light, the energy of light that it's interacting with. And when you plot this, each chemical has its own unique pattern, and it's used many times to identify uh, qualitatively what chemicals are present, what types of chemicals are present, and in depending on the energy of light, it can also see what types of um, chemical bonds are present uh, as well. And it's used very extensively, not only in biochemical assays to find different proteins, but also uh, in organic chemistry to identify different types of bonds and different chemical groupings on a larger molecule as a whole. Typically, the wavelength that has the highest absorbance reading, that uh, the maximum wavelength is used to prepare calibration graphs because at this, uh, at this wavelength, a small change in concentration will give a larger change in the overall absorbance. This is the full range that it can do. So it's more easily seen and detected uh, in the next graph. The other thing uh, for the next graph, preparing calibration graphs, is used with dilutions. So based on this image, you can see a low concentration is very light, 
a high concentration is very dark. So you're, we're looking at how the light interacts. It is interacting more with this concentrated sample and less with uh, the lower concentration sample. When you're looking at dilutions, uh, especially in chemistry, you're using the molarity uh, calculation. Molarity is moles over liter. And when you do a dilution, you're starting out with a high concentration, you're taking some volume of this high concentration and adding more water to it or adding more solvent to it to dilute that amount. The total number of moles did not change, just the volume. But because the volume changed, the concentration will also change because that same number of moles are now spread out over a larger volume. In a typical uh, sample of dilution uh, would be something like this, where the, there's a 30 milliliter sample of a 0 0.500 molar solution of copper sulfate, and that's mixed with 50 milliliters of water. So what is the final molarity? So first you have a concentration of 0.5 molar, and you have 30 milliliters of it. Afterwards, at the very end, you have a total volume of that 30 milliliters plus the, eight, the 50 milliliters of water for a final total volume of 80 milliliters. Moles in both cases are constant, and you're trying to solve for what is the final concentration. So you can use the molarity equation twice to go through and see exactly what is happening. You have a constant, to start with, you have a concentration and a volume, so you can determine how many moles this is. When you have that number of moles, you can spread it across the new volume of 80 milliliters, and you end up you end up with a final concentration, a final molarity in this case, of 0 0.1875 molar. So in this case, you're looking at uh, this dilution and you're using two molarity calculations where moles are equal to each other. This is where M1 V1 equals M2 V2 comes from. This simplified equation is used only in dilutions. It has no other use anywhere else, just when you're diluting something, because in this case, the moles are constant, and therefore the ratio between moles and liters varies and affects the uh, concentration in an inverse way. So in something like uh, preparing a calibration curve, uh, many times in chemistry or in a lab, you're preparing a calibration curve using concentration. You have a higher concentration to start with, and you're, you are making various dilutions to that concentration. And then when you have that series, so in this case, there's a whole series of different solutions at different concentrations. You can then measure a property based on the concentration. In this case, in a lab like this, it's measuring the absorbance based on the concentration. And calibration curves are linearly related. Beer's law has a uh, linear relationship between absorbance and concentration uh, so long as the absorbance is below one. And this can be seen when plotting the absorbance versus the concentration, you can see a straight line. And this is how um, you can relate these two properties, concentration and absorbance. Now you can do this and determine a slope and from the equation of that line, the equation of this line, 
you can uh, relate the two properties. Given an, an absorbance, you could figure out what would the concentration be. If you're given a concentration, you can calculate what the overall absorbance would be. Now, these lines aren't going to be exactly uh, exact with every single data point. These are the lines of best fit. And you're going through and preparing uh, calibration graphs using the trend line. Now, in this example, I plotted a line where the equation is y equals 0.005x. This was just um, the calculated equation from Excel. Notice also that there is no other term. This is a y equals mx plus zero. There is no b term. The y-intercept is zero. At a concentration of zero, anything, it should read an absorbance of zero. There are no molecules there to absorb any of the light. So when you're using, uh, if you were to graph by hand, you can determine uh, the slope of a line based on rise over run. You can easily force a line to go through zero. In Excel or other graphing programs, there are different functions that can give you these values. The one that came up just through the graph only had one significant figure. And if I go through and actually use the different functions in um, Excel, you can get a more accurate uh, value for this. You can uh, use the slope function, select all of the y values, comma, then all of the x values, and that will give you a slope. And you can use the intercept function, selecting again, all the known y values, comma, all the known x values. In uh, calibration graphs, or particularly these ones in spectroscopy, it is good to force the line to go through zero. Um, because again, at a concentration of zero, there is zero absorbance. And these two functions, just slope and intercept, don't take that into account. So this function right here will give, uh, will force the line to go through zero and then give you that slope value. And to use this as the linest function, known y values, comma, known x values, comma, type in the word false, all in parentheses. And then that would give you the y equals mx function. Looking at this, you have uh, y, which is your absorbance, x is the concentration, b is zero, m is the slope, which is constant. And in these types of measurements, you're holding the path length constant and the wavelength constant, the molar absorptivity. So the slope of that line on your calibration graph is the molar absorptivity constant times the path length. And if you know one, then you can calculate uh, the other. So for example, if you have a calibration graph, you have the um, equation for that line. If you're given a concentration, you can solve for an absorbance. You can plug in the concentration value. Um, I'm sorry, if you're given a, an absorbance, you can plug in the absorbance value, solve for the concentration. But you can also determine what the absorbance or transmittance is from a concentration value. That can be plugged in directly and you can solve for absorbance. And then the absorbance itself can be converted into percent transmittance. 
this experiment uses one of the FET simulations to relate absorbance with concentration, path length, and molar absorptivity, as well as seeing uh, those different types of graphs, uh, an absorbance spectrum, a calibration graph, and then using that calibration graph to determine uh, concentrations and absorbance and transmission. In the first part of the experiment, you're just moving the things around, kind of getting, uh, playing around with that FET simulation to change um, the concentration, change the path length, and change the wavelength of light, and just observe how that affects the percent transmittance and how that would affect the absorbance of the different uh, solutions. In the activity, you're choosing the Beer's Law simulation. From here, you can use the red button to turn on the light source and see how when you vary the path length, vary concentration, or vary the wavelength, how this affects both the transmission and the absorbance. In the next part, when you select one of these compounds, you're going to vary through the entire wavelength of light and record the percent transmittance at an increment of every 10 nanometers. Graphing this will give you an absorbance spectrum. In the second graph, you're going to vary the concentration at a single wavelength in order to obtain a calibration curve that shows how concentration, transmittance, and absorbance are related. In the second part of the experiment, you're preparing your own uh, absorbance spectrum. You're going to select one of those compounds, not the drink mix, but one of the real chemical compounds um, on the drop-down menu and pick a concentration and just vary the absorbance. You'll select the variable um, wavelength and every 10 nanometers, you're going to record what is the percent transmittance. From the percent transmittance, you can convert that to absorbance. Uh, in this simulation, the percent transmittance gives two decimal places and the absorbance, uh, so therefore there's a total of four significant figures where the absorbance reading in the simulation only has three significant figures. So by using the percent transmittance, you can uh, obtain a fourth significant figure when calculating the absorbance. So what you'll do is select, uh, select your compound, go through, and at each data point, every 10 nanometers for the full length, 380 um, to 770, I believe, you're going to go through and record what is the percent transmittance. You're going to convert that to absorbance and then plot the absorbance versus the wavelength making sure that the graph is properly labeled with what compound you select it and what concentration you select it as well. The second graph that you're preparing is a calibration plot or a calibration graph of that same compound. So you're going to go through and see what wavelength would be most appropriate and then vary the concentration of your compound to see what the uh, absorbance is or what the percent transmittance is for each of those different data points, and then plot a linear calibration graph. So usually when selecting a wavelength to prepare a calibration graph, you would choose the wavelength that has the highest absorbance. You can prepare a calibration graph at any wavelength whatsoever, and all that would change is the slope, that factor of um, 
the relationship between absorbance and concentration. But by choosing the wavelength with the highest uh, absorbance, that means that even small variations in concentration will be able to be uh, detected in this larger change. Versus if in this case, I chose a concentrate or I, I chose a wavelength of 700, all of that variation would only occur between this tiny little range. And the amount uh, that the absorbance changes would be very little and difficult to uh, detect. Where in a larger absorbance range, it's more easily detected. So you're going to go through and select that same compound that you prepared an absorbance spectrum for and select a wavelength, leave that constant, and then choose 10 different concentrations throughout uh, that range and record the percent transmittance. Remember, this is for a calibration plot. So the concentrations need to be such that the absorbance is always below one. If the absorbance is above one, that means the, uh, the relationship is no longer linear and Beer's law doesn't hold true anymore. You need to make sure that any concentrations you choose, the absorbance is always below a value of one. Some of the questions at the end of the lab report refer to preparing stock solutions and utilizing a stock solution. So a stock solution is just a more concentrated solution that you would have prepared and then you would take all of the dilutions and make all of the other uh, solutions from that initially. So a stock solution is usually prepared using a volumetric flask. And this is a type of flask used to specifically contain an exact amount out to two decimal places. So a 100 milliliter volumetric flask would have an accuracy and a significance of 100.00 milliliters. And its uh, solutions or particular stock solutions are prepared in this way because it takes into account the volume of the solid that's dissolved. So when you take a salt and dissolve it, um, that salt still takes up a volume. If you want to make a high concentrated solution, if you want to make 100 milliliters of it, if you measure out that amount of salt and add 100 milliliters, the final volume will be over 100 milliliters. So by using a volumetric flask, you can add the solid direct uh, into the flask with the known amount and then fill the flask up to the mark where the final total volume is exactly 100 milliliters or whatever size flask you choose. And that way you don't have to worry about the volume that the solid takes up. Once a solution is prepared and the solid is dissolved, then the volumes can mix as normal. And you could measure out five milliliters of this solution with 95 milliliters of water. Uh, and that would be fine. But when preparing solutions from solids, you typically would use a volumetric flask. And you'll go through and those calculations talk about preparing stock solutions and how much of the solid sample you would need to weigh out and uh, using the dilution calculations to figure out concentrations and volumes based on amounts of the stock solution. As you work through the experiment, you're looking at how light interacts with these solutions and how it affects what you actually see from different path lengths and different concentrations to different environments that the solution or compound happens to be in. All of these affect how light interacts and the color that you see.